Hi, everybody. This is Dave Robinson. I am a psychiatrist in London, Ontario, and the lead author for the 2018 Clinical Practice Guidelines Diabetes and Mental Health Chapter, which is a role that I am reprising from the 2013 version. This time around, I had the privilege of working with a wider range of co-authors, and I wanted to introduce them to you briefly. Michael Coons is a psychologist from Hamilton, Ontario. Heidi Hensel is a child and adolescent psychiatrist from London, Ontario. Michael Vallis is a psychologist from Halifax, Nova Scotia. And Jean-Francois Yale is an endocrinologist from Montreal, Quebec. In particular, I wanted to point out the stellar efforts that were made by Dr. Vallis in his contributions to the chapter. He was my right-hand person for this, and I wanted to thank him publicly for all of the effort that he put into it. Some of the key changes that were made this time around were to emphasize the wider range of psychiatric disorders that seem to predispose people in particular to type 2 diabetes. This was significantly expanded over the 2013 version, and I am certain that the list is not complete. It's just these were the conditions that we had more information for this time around. I'll be speaking to these in more detail in a slide coming up. So I will just emphasize the second point on the screen, which is to really look for the metabolic parameters in people that have psychiatric illnesses, even if they don't take any medications, they appear to be at risk for being overweight or developing obesity, having lipid abnormalities and glucose dysregulation. But particularly in people that are on medications, it is important to keep an eye on these indices and in particular with people taking atypical antipsychotics. We were thrilled to be able to be able to expand our chapter and I will just point out on this particular slide the association between diabetes and long sorrow or melancholia that was pointed out by an English physician named Thomas Willis who is the same person that the circle of Willis is named after. This is a complicated slide and looks at the overall susceptibility that we were able to glean from the literature review that we did this time around. At the center of it is major depressive disorder, where there's been a very well-established reciprocal susceptibility for developing, in particular, type 2 diabetes. People with one condition are at double or approximately triple the general population risk for developing the other condition. One of the things that we noticed this time around was the increased risk of suicide. Now, people that have major depressive disorder certainly think about suicide, attempt it, and unfortunately complete it more than the general public. But people that had made suicide attempts were also susceptible to develop diabetes and vice versa, which is something that we didn't know about five years ago. Continuing in a clockwise fashion in the bottom right-hand corner, Schizophrenia spectrum and related disorders is now the chapter title in the DSM-5. And this has been a well-established finding for decades. People that had never taken antipsychotic medication, either for refusing it or because they had schizophrenia prior to the early 50s when chlorpromazine was developed, were noted to be at an increased risk of developing diabetes as well. Continuing over to the bottom left-hand corner for sleep-wake disorders, it was particularly obstructive sleep apnea that seemed to cause the depressive symptoms that then put people at risk for developing type 2 diabetes. Feeding and eating disorders is the name of the chapter now in the DSM-5. And certainly as people gain weight and become obese, that is one of the eating disorders and would predispose people to both major depression and type 2 diabetes, but there are certain eating disorders that can develop as a result of having diabetes. And I will speak about those more in some of the slides coming up. At the nine o'clock position, there is generalized anxiety disorder, which is hugely comorbid with major depressive disorder. The overlap there is about 80%. And if you have one, you have a very high chance of developing the other. Moving up to about the 10 o'clock position, we have stress, trauma, abuse, or neglect. And post-traumatic stress disorder was moved out of the anxiety disorders in DSM-5 and now 
is in a chapter on its own. In reading the articles for this chapter, there is a significant change in people's metabolic profile as a result of severe or repeated trauma and people with PTSD or acute stress disorder, as well as significant histories of abuse or neglect are also at risk for developing diabetes. Moving up to the upper left-hand corner, we had some information this time around about maladaptive personality traits or personality disorders, and they were twofold. People that were constantly in a state of conflict were found to have an elevated risk of diabetes, but also people that were very passive and avoidant, and in particular didn't like to go for checkups with their primary care provider were found to be at risk for major depressive disorder as well. And then finally up to bipolar and related disorders in the upper right hand corner, there was some really interesting information this time around, confirming that people with bipolar disorder at any stage of the illness, not necessarily just the depressed part, were at risk for uh, developing type two diabetes. But in one study, they found somebody actually had the glucose dysregulation start their mood episode. Now, normally you would think that somebody developed bipolar disorder first and through the depressed phase or other metabolic changes would be at risk for developing type two diabetes, but they actually felt that the glucose dysregulation this time around caused the bipolar disorder to start, which was really quite a fascinating description period. They also looked at the number of mood episodes in people with bipolar disorder who had diabetes and in general found that the glucose dysregulation was something that would cause more mood episodes to occur. And one finding from one study suggested that people who had a higher level of glucose on average tended to have more manic or hypomanic episodes. Typically, psychiatrists and endocrinologists would be looking at stabilizing people's thyroid function as a way of stabilizing their mood, but this may be an indication for the future that we're actually going to be checking sugar levels to see whether that has an impact on people's stability in terms of having bipolar disorder. There is a strong and increasingly strengthening association between a variety of mental illnesses and developing type 2 diabetes. Some of the nonspecific factors would be that if you were struggling with the psychiatric condition, in addition to having diabetes, you're probably not going to be as adherent to the medication or other self-care aspects of the illness. People do have functional impairment due to their symptoms psychiatrically, and that certainly makes an impact on their motivation, energy levels, and ability to appreciate the nature and consequences of the illness. The risk of complications goes up. This is a factor of one plus one equals three or four because of the um, comorbid contribution of a psychiatric illness and having type two diabetes. And certainly this drives up healthcare costs because people tend not to look after their care as well as they do when they're not, say, struggling with very significant anxiety or depressive symptoms. The risk of early mortality increases as well, which is uh, an unfortunate but reasonably evident consequence of the above factors. So again, depending on the study, major depressive disorder does increase the risk of type 2 diabetes by about 60%, and there is a very high prevalence of diabetes symptoms and actual major depressive disorder in people with type 2 diabetes. This slide helps to make the distinction between depressive symptoms and major depressive disorder. So the symptoms are present in quite a high percentage, about a third of people with diabetes. But if we're going to look at the criteria, which is five out of nine of the depressive symptoms that are present for at least a two week span, then about 10% of people with type two diabetes have major depressive disorder, which is about twice the rate that we see in the general population, potentially a little bit higher than that. And that 
depression in particular really interferes with diabetes care. People are not active. They don't take their medications. And about 90% of diabetes care needs to be done by the person directly. So having comorbid major depressive disorder with your diabetes really does worsen the outcome. Not everything that can complicate diabetes is found in the DSM. And this entity known as diabetes distress is possibly even worse for diabetes outcomes than major depressive disorder is. It's defined as the difficulties that one has specifically related to caring for diabetes. And if you listen to the people that have this, they're not so much thinking about death and dying and the other things that go along with major depressive disorder, but they will describe struggles that are very specific to diabetes in particular. This slide is a comparison between diabetes distress and major depressive disorder. And it looks at some of the things that would help clinicians make a distinction between the two because diabetes distress really doesn't respond to antidepressant medications. In fact, that would not be really a recommended treatment for them. So in order to help gauge the level of diabetes distress, there is a diabetes distress scale which has 17 items broken into the four subscales seen at the bottom of the features. This is a self-rating scale that, that people can fill out before they have their appointment. It does look at the four things of emotional burden, which is significant and worth asking about. Then the thing that surprises lots of healthcare providers is that there is actually a physician or this probably should say a prescriber-related distress subscale. Uh, clinicians can bring their own stresses to people, and this is a chance for them to at least make mention of it. The regimen itself can provide distress for people, and then the relationships that people have are affected when somebody has diabetes, that the family, for example, thinks that they have to become the food police and remind the person to take the medication or exercise or watch what he or she eats, and that can provide an alternate source of stress for them. The column on the right-hand side is major depressive disorder, which is nicely screened for in primary care settings using the PHQ-9. These are just uh, uh, rewordings of the criteria from the DSM-5 with a simple rating scale of zero to three, and it goes through the nine symptoms. I think this is an excellent scale for primary care practitioners to use because it reminds them of the, the criteria for major depressive disorder. And it's really helpful to show on a visit to visit basis whether improvement in these symptoms is occurring because you can score them and see that the number is actually going down. In order to assist with sorting out what exactly is going on, there are some screening tools that can help you decide if somebody is dealing with generalized anxiety or a major depressive disorder or diabetes distress. So the two scales that we wanted to promote the use of are the problem areas in diabetes or PAID scale, and then the diabetes distress scale. The World Health Organization has a quality of life scale, the WHO-5, and then depression and anxiety can be screened for using the hospital anxiety and depression scale. The PHQ-9 is available. If you just look further down the screen, there is a website, the PHQ-9 screeners, and they have them for generalized anxiety disorder as well. It's called the GAD or GAD-7. And then lastly, there's the Beck depression inventory, but there are lots of ways of screening for anxiety and depression. But what we wanted to point out is all of those anxiety and depressive symptoms may actually be related to diabetes distress. And that was one of the key features of this chapter was to differentiate that from diagnosable conditions from the DSM-5 because the treatment for these conditions is different. One of the other conditions which doesn't appear in the DSM-5 is known as psychological insulin resistance or insulin refusal. And I'll just walk down. This is the perception of worsening illness severity with the addition of insulin. What happens here is that people have the illness for some period of time, and as it progresses, they will need more medications and at some point need insulin. 
when they need the insulin, they feel like it's a personal failure or some sort of uh, discovery or benchmark that they haven't really been taking the care of their illness that seriously, and they are quite resistant to the notion of taking insulin. It takes extra training. They can now develop hypoglycemic episodes. Their driver's licenses may be in jeopardy if they can't keep their sugars under better control. So they just deny that they re require the insulin and are quite resistant to starting it. Many times they feel that there is an element of control that they've lost over the illness and that it is a personal setback for them. And they don't think they're going to gain anything in particular from adding the insulin. So this is a fairly common reaction and this is what's going on in the background for people that are initially reluctant to start their insulin and again this is called psychological insulin resistance. In order to assist with this, this table was included here for people that would have a fear of hypoglycemic episodes, which is one of the factors in psychological insulin resistance, but also something that anybody who takes insulin would have a concern about developing. So for this, people will realize hopefully fairly soon that it's their imagination that is the worst enemy here, not necessarily their ability to control the illness. And if you ask them to look at the actual number of hypoglycemic episodes versus the ones that they think they're having, the numbers can be quite different. If we go down this slide, of course, a hypoglycemic episode would be a concern for anybody, but there are ways of dealing with that and improving overall control and trying to minimize the number of episodes or the effect that those episodes have. One of the next steps in cognitive behavior therapy or CBT is to get people to try to do things differently, look at the results, record the results, and then keep an open mind to changing their beliefs and their behavior in the future. And you would go through this episode probably a few times, pointing out that their fear or their imagination is really what they're battling more so than reality. And I thought this was a nice table to include to at least give primary care practitioners some template for how they would address the fear of hypoglycemia. Many of the studies in which cognitive behavior therapy was used were very strongly in favor of it, and it isn't that difficult a skill to learn. So that certainly remains, in many cases, a recommended or the superior treatment for addressing many aspects of diabetes care. There, of course, are other types of psychotherapy, such as interpersonal or psychodynamic that can be used if people have that theoretical orientation or it would be difficult to get training in cognitive behavior therapy. And then of course there's antidepressant medication which can address a wide range of depressive and anxious symptoms. But one of the concerns in using it is that people often feel the medication is going to do the heavy lifting for them. And once they're on a prescription medication, they don't have ongoing personal responsibility for their care. So antidepressants are really only ever part of the picture. They certainly do have a role and can be very helpful, but they're ideally used in conjunction with other forms of psychotherapy or behavioral changes that would help people's overall diabetes care. This table shows in more detail the distinction between the cognitive and behavioral components between these two aspects of CBT. You can have cognitive therapy on its own and then there are certain behavior therapies. So just to recognize that there are different elements to it, the cognitive component, people will keep track of their distressing automatic thoughts, which are usually quite negative, like I'm going to die prematurely from diabetes and they would of course have uh, some negative emotions attached with that then they just 
presume that things are going to happen in spite of their best efforts to change things and as a result their behavior changes. So the cognitive component would have people keep track of these negative automatic thoughts with a view of challenging them and in essence changing their attitude for the future in a way that keeps them more open to doing things that would be helpful for them. Then the behavioral component is largely to get people doing things, which is the top line, the behavioral activation. If you can get people up and doing anything, it's beneficial for the illness. And in particular, I like to misquote Newton by saying that a body at rest tends to stay at rest unless there is some external motivation applied for helping the illness. There are some suggestions here, such as scheduling pleasant and meaningful events and trying to develop more effective communication skills, looking at things that they can master to develop some self-esteem and some sense of control over the illness and to keep themselves open to new experiences. Those would all be the behavioral or the movement or action parts of CBT. I wanted to point out the potential resources that are available to people, irrespective of which condition they're struggling with. So there are chapters or national associations that would deal with all of the entities shown on the screen and a variety of other ones that weren't shown on the slide. In particular, I would like to point out the efforts made by the Canadian Mental Health Association, which is CMHA. It's a national organization and they support people through groups in education and clinical care across the country. This organization is different than CAMH, which is the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, which is in Toronto. It's the same letters, but the acronyms are frequently mistaken for one another. This slide was included for practitioners to keep tabs on their people who take psychiatric medications. We know that some medications are more notorious than others for causing weight gain and metabolic concerns, and we mentioned two of them on this slide, olanzapine and clozapine in particular, but others can be problematic. And in some cases, people who take olanzapine and clozapine are just fine from a metabolic standpoint. So it's really the monitoring that we're promoting by including this slide. The American Psychiatric Association and Canadian Psychiatric Association each have their own monitoring schedules. We included one with this set of guidelines as well, but it's important that you pick one and at least do some monitoring. It doesn't really matter which one you choose. But in some cases, medications get a bad reputation when it's actually lifestyle factors that contribute, such as cigarette smoking, Substance abuse, dietary choices, and lack of exercise can certainly worsen people's metabolic situation, and sometimes it gets unfairly blamed on the medication. And the last point, having a comorbid psychiatric condition often worsens diabetes control because of energy or motivation or anhedonia, etc., that people tend not to have the effort to be able to put into their diabetes care, and it does result in either earlier or more serious complications. This slide was included to provide more detail about the recommended parameters in metabolic screening. At baseline, taking a weight and calculating BMI is recommended along with taking a waist circumference, baseline blood pressure, getting a fasting glucose, and ideally an A1C would be important. While people are fasting, a lipid profile would be advantageous to have at baseline, as well as taking a history of their alcohol, tobacco, and recreational drug use, and then asking about a family history of medical or in particular metabolic concerns. Then checking weight on a monthly basis, especially for the first three months, is important. Often that will be an indication as to whether there may be future difficulties related to weight gain on medication. Depending on how concerns develop or not, certainly you'd want to check things again at three months. And after that, keeping an eye on these indices at a three to six month interval is recommended. 
with at the least frequent end keeping an eye on things annually this time around we had a much more comprehensive list of recommendations and I wanted to go through them one by one the first one is to screen people there are entities such as diabetes distress psychological insulin resistance or insulin refusal fear of hypoglycemic episodes that don't appear in the DSM-5 but they can make a huge impact on people's diabetes care so to keep these entities in mind and to use either self-report questionnaires or asking about them in interviews then of course we have the psychiatric disorders that I went through in the previous slide but in particular to ask about depressive symptoms or the presence of major depressive disorder and anxiety disorders and again there are widespread self-report questionnaires or uh, interview questions that you can ask to screen for these conditions recommendation number two is to send people for specialized health care if they are struggling with significant distress related to their diabetes if their fear of hypoglycemic episodes can't be addressed and is interfering with their care if they won't start insulin and it is to their detriment or if there are conditions that are diagnosable through the dsm-5 that you feel are beyond your ability to manage don't hesitate to send people for specialized care for these concerns because they are actually modifiable factors and if they can be significantly addressed they will very much be to the benefit of people with diabetes the third recommendation is to seek out or develop the expertise through an interprofessional team in particular depressive symptoms adherence and glycemic control can be much more effectively addressed by people with skills in a wide variety of areas so if it is at all possible people should be referred to the teams with this type of expertise this slide focuses on the non-medication or psychosocial interventions that can make a dramatic difference to people for their diabetes care the first one is motivational interventions or in particular motivational interviewing this is not a really hard skill to learn and gets people to focus on their long-term goals and building the inherent motivation that they have within themselves to achieve things it is something that you can pick up fairly quickly and can have dramatically positive results as we saw from the diabetes distress scale there are multiple contributions to the stress that people with diabetes have and learning how to manage their stress possibly through better coping skills is also highly recommended in terms of improving diabetes outcomes family therapy is recommended and can be very helpful generally when one person in a family has diabetes it does make an impact on everybody and addressing it and trying to look for solutions with the entire family can be very helpful and then for people that require individualized supervision case management is recommended generally the case manager keeps very close tabs on the person and records things that are useful for the other people to look at and this can again make a dramatic difference in somebody's outcome the use of antidepressants is very well established in treating major depressive disorder uh, acute and maintenance phases and antidepressants also have an ability to treat a widespread range of other symptoms in particular anxiety symptoms and cognitive behavior therapy shows very robust results in terms of treating depression as well either in conjunction with antidepressant medications or on its own there are some people that will not take prescription medications and this would be the preferred treatment modality for people 
who either refuse to take medications or unfortunately haven't found one that is either effective or that they can live with in terms of tolerability. This slide draws particular attention to monitoring the metabolic indices in people that take antipsychotic medications. In particular, it's the second generation or atypical ones that need to be monitored, and the schedule for this was provided. For those of you that are unfamiliar with what third generation refers to, that is aripiprazole or the trade name Abilify, and there is a new one in Canada named Rexalti, or the generic name is Rexpiprazole. We were pleased to provide some specific recommendations regarding children and adolescents. And here we are recommending in particular that screening at diagnosis take place because major depressive disorder can present differently in extremes of age and often in children and adolescents, for example, they will have much more of a somatic focus to their concerns than adults will although the diagnostic criteria for major depression do not change in the child, adolescent, or geriatric age group. Secondly, looking for psychosocial difficulties, family distress, and other mental health disorders is recommended for this age group. The next part of this combines the recommendation to look for the expertise to help with young people that have diabetes and additional mental health concerns by looking for the expertise to work on those parts of their illness and to focus on educational interventions both on an individual and family basis so that everybody gets the education that they need and a family solution can be developed towards whatever difficulties present themselves. This recommendation looks at adolescents with type 1 diabetes in particular, and the suggestion here is that regular screening should take place using as non-judgmental language as possible about dieting practices, whether they engage in any binge eating behaviors and might occasionally miss a dose of insulin. This sometimes is known as diabulimia. It's a combination of bulimia and diabetes and has been described in particular in adolescent females because they fairly quickly learn that if they don't take insulin they don't gain weight and they effectively just pee out the sugar and they use that as a way of controlling weight. This is a particularly important recommendation in light of the epidemic of body shaming that is currently going on and the very significant effects that it can have on young people. So by regularly screening and asking about it, we hope that the door gets opened that when they want to discuss it, they feel they have an ally in this area in their healthcare professionals. We developed some key messages for people who live with diabetes and wanted to start an educational campaign to introduce what diabetes distress, psychological insulin resistance, and persistent fear of hypoglycemic episodes were, and to make them aware that these are things that can 
occur and will negatively impact their diabetes care. The second point refers to the reduced life expectancy, otherwise known as all-cause mortality, in people who have diabetes and depressive disorders or probably a wide range of psychiatric disorders, but the evidence for depression is stronger than it is for any other condition. And to point out that the mental health concerns on top of struggling with diabetes do end up taking a toll and that life expectancy is reduced as a result. We wanted to encourage people to be regularly screened and to ask for screening for anxiety disorders, depressive disorders, etc., in conjunction with their diabetes appointments. And to draw a comparison between people that have diabetes and people who have diabetes in conjunction with a mental health concern, that the mental health concern will adversely affect their diabetes care in terms of reducing their quality of life, increasing their functional impairment or sense of impairment, increasing their risk of diabetes complications, and also that their care is overall going to be more expensive if they have a combination of both sets of concerns. Cognitive behavior therapy or other patient-centered approaches, and in particular motivational interviewing, in conjunction with stress management, coping skills, family therapy, and case management should be incorporated into primary care and can make dramatic differences when they are utilized effectively. And that self-management skills are crucial for people with diabetes because about 90% of the care falls on their shoulders. And some of the points that we've made here, such as adapting to diabetes, trying to determine if there are co-occurring mental health issues and addressing them, and then reducing the concerns about diabetes distress, fear of hypoglycemic episodes, and reducing or eradicating psychological insulin resistance would be very beneficial for their diabetes care. We're also suggesting quite strongly that anybody who takes psychiatric medications be screened regularly for metabolic parameters. We went through that list and there are other monitoring schedules available from other organizations. But rather than getting into a debate as to which monitoring program is best or most comprehensive, I think it's important that these things get measured and other indices can be added on a case-by-case -case basis and that practitioners can develop their own ideal schedule, but particularly the baseline indices and looking at weight gain for the first six months are highly recommended. Based on whether problems arise or not, practitioners can look at other strategies such as adding medications for side effects, adjusting dosages, or even switching medications to try to reduce or eliminate metabolic difficulties. This slide specifically seeks to connect with people that have diabetes and to indicate that it should be expected that this illness will take an emotional toll. Things like anxiety symptoms, depressive symptoms, the distress that they feel in conjunction with their care are all to be expected. And this hopefully will empower them to mention it to their healthcare providers and to participate in some of the recommended treatment modalities and activities that are very likely to reduce their suffering. It is our hope that by providing this information that people with diabetes and mental health concerns will mention this to their family and members of their diabetes healthcare team, that help is available and will be provided if we as healthcare professionals are made aware that there are difficulties. 
and that they should feel as if they have permission to talk about their emotional changes and anxieties in particular, but also that some of their habits such as eating and sleeping routines will be affected and they should feel empowered to mention this to people because it can interfere with their diabetes care and there are effective ways of managing these concerns. This slide is to provide information that mental health concerns in conjunction with diabetes are a complicating factor and to empower people to monitor and report any emotional distress that they feel in conjunction with their diabetes because it will make an impact on their long-term care and effective strategies are available for reducing them. The second point is that a wide and growing list of mental health concerns do carry an elevated risk of developing type 2 diabetes with them. This slide shows a screen capture from the guidelines.diabetes.ca website and lists some of the resources that are available and they are very helpful for all sorts of practitioners. This is an indication of the apps that are available and the tools, videos, slides, and chapters that are available for dissemination of the educational content in the guidelines. This slide indicates where the diabetes guidelines are available and provides a phone number as well for getting Diabetes Canada resources.